presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. She had an amazing life. You know, she had, she had adventures. She was somebody. Um, she journeyed, she traveled, she grew. Coming up, a presidential wife long overlooked by history, now finally coming into her own. A conversation about the life and adventures of Louisa Catherine Adams with her biographer, Louisa Thomas. That's Dialogue Next. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. Most all American school children learn about the Adams family. No, not the TV Adams family, but President John Adams and his wife Abigail and their son, President John Quincy Adams. Left in the shadows, though, has been the wife of John Quincy Adams, Louisa. She even referred to herself in her memoir as a nobody. But as you will learn today, she was far from that and actually left a copious trail of writings that illuminate not only her fascinating life, but also the political life of America in the 1800s. It wasn't until another Louisa came along, though, that those papers were incorporated into a complete biography. Louisa Thomas became fascinated with Louisa Adams after reading some of her letters. She spent years writing Louisa, The Extraordinary Life of Mrs. Adams. I talked with Thomas at the 2017 Sun Valley Writers Conference about why she felt so compelled to bring another Louisa back to life. So it's an interesting coincidence that your name is the same as the name of your subject. This was um, part of the interest, but certainly not the reason that you wrote the book. You had been researching another book when you stumbled across the voice and the writing of Louisa Adams. It's true. I, um, I was doing some research about Andrew Jackson, um, John Quincy's rival for the presidency, and I came across some of her letters. I was just completely struck by this voice. It was so different than any of the other letters I was reading. It was um, very vivid and it was very funny, which was unusual and, and a pleasure. And it was very um, acerbic sometimes and irreverent. And she wasn't writing for posterity. I mean, so many of um, the men that I was reading, including um, including at times Jackson, but also certainly including John Quincy, they were writing for their future biographers, and Louisa was just writing for herself, and there was something liberating about that. And so I thought to myself, who is this other Louisa? You know, and so I, I wanted to know more about her, and, and you know, the more I the more I learned, the more I wanted to to know. You couldn't get her out of your head, right? I mean, that was 2008, and you didn't start writing or researching the book until 2011. Yeah. So, in fact, I actually. Almost, a, almost signed a contract to write another book, and I was about to do so when I told my agent that I just, I'm just gonna write a proposal for this book just to kind of get it out of my system. And I did that in about, I don't know, 36 hours, and sent that off, and my agent was on vacation in South Africa, and she called me from South Africa, and she said, this is the, this is the book you have to write. She left a lot behind. Why do you suppose that there hadn't been this nature of book before? I think part of it had to do with the fact that her mother-in-law casts such an enormous shadow. Abigail. Abigail, and she's very different than Abigail. So I think a lot of people who, I think a lot of people who maybe read her letters, read them with expectation that she was going to be this kind of industrious, cheerful, strong-willed, you know, Shakespeare quoting, um, you know, farmeress like Abigail Adams, who was very involved in politics and all of that. And what they find instead is someone who's Shakespeare quoting, but um, who often has um, periods of, um, malaise and sickness and a lot of self-doubt and so there was this perception of her for a long time that she was kind of sickly and sad and I think people sort of 
didn't dive deeper into her story because that was the kind of reputation that she had. In fact, I can't tell you how many biographies of John Quincy Adams completely dismiss her out of hand. Well, she didn't help herself too much because she was so self-deprecating. Yes. Deprecating, rather. She, the titles of her um, memoirs that she eventually wrote were things like The Adventures of a Nobody. I mean, more than self-deprecating, that's self-effacing. Yeah, exactly. Record of a Life. Narrative of a Journey, which, as we will discuss, was more than just a journey. Um, but in a way, those very titles made you more intrigued, didn't they? I mean, who writes three memoirs about themselves? <laughs> I mean, she may have called herself a nobody, but she was, you know, she, in the beginning of Narrative of a Journey, which we can talk a little bit more about because it's a remarkable document um, chronicling an incredible story. She, she begins by saying that she is writing this um, so that people will remember that she is one who was, and she underscored who was. She knew she would be forgotten, but she did something to sort of guard against that. And so it's the tension between someone who, in some real ways, really accepted, you know, the, the judgment of history that she knew would be passed on her, that she was a nothing, she was a nobody. And yet, she made something of her life and kind of gave it meaning. And so I wanted to explore that tension. I, I never in this project, and this can be difficult for some people, I think, I never wanted to kind of make these grand claims for her and what she accomplished and what she did. Um, I don't think she was some sort of secret agent of power, although she had a really critical influence in John Quincy's um, political and diplomatic career. What interested me was precisely this kind of psychological and emotional and, and um, you know, personal interior tension in life. And um, the thing is that she had an amazing life. You know, she had, she had adventures. She was somebody. Um, she journeyed. She traveled. She grew. And it's that story. It's a really kind of an interior life story. It's almost the kind of life that is we come to expect from being explored in novels, um, which she read a ton of, um, but you don't very often see in popular biography where we're sort of, I think, you know, we expect a bit more of, you know, accomplishment and, and power. Um, and that's not what, what I was interested in doing with this. And so, you know, you can never, you can never assume that you really know someone or know their thoughts, but you can get pretty close with her because she left a real record of her life. I mean, thousands of letters, three memoirs, diaries, plays, poetry. I mean, I was drowning in paper. And 600, well, you went through 600 microfilms. Reels of microfilm, you know, of, it's just. Of the Adam's family paper. And, and that's not just it. I mean, I found things and. I think it's fascinating. You found letters that had never been really read before in Pennsylvania. Yeah, my, th these are actually my favorite letters because it was in a, pa a paper collection of um, correspondence from a Supreme Court justice um, who was very close to the Adamses and very close to Louisa in particular. And her letters, it was a whole stack of them, they were in a box marked Letters from Ladies. <laughs> and it had obviously not been opened in a very long time. <laughs> What a find. Well, let's talk about Louisa and what makes her special and what made you spend years of your life uh, entering, trying to enter her brain. She was our first, ultimately our first foreign-born mm -hmm. first lady. She grew up abroad in England and France, which was not necessarily an asset in those days. In fact, there was a lot of distrust um, toward the monarchical system. It's really hard for us, I think, right now to remember that in those days, the idea of a republic was very fragile. You know, there was this expectation. This had never really been done since Rome, and that had collapsed. And there was this fear that this wasn't going to work, and that we had to do everything we could to create this kind of aristocracy of virtue instead of birth and merit. Um, and there was this sense that the European courts were depraved and corrupted, and the language that was used to describe them is just, it's hilarious in how kind of 
over the top it is. I mean, they're describing their, you know, in the most offensive ways, you know, they're just these, describing these orgies and, you know, they have this kind of idea that it's not only those courts were corrupt, but that they were corrupting. And that if you came into too close a contact with them, they would um, plant the seed of, of some sort of virus that would spread across the United States and undermine the Republic. I mean, I'm describing it in this kind of um, over the top terms, but if you read editorials from papers, that's, that's what they were described as. And, and women were very close to power there. And that exactly, was... so these women had these salons and they were, had too much power, especially in places like France and you know, learning French and things like that. And that was, um, you know, Thomas Jefferson would say that you know, had there been no queen, there wasn't the king that was a problem in France, it was the queen, you know. There was this idea that, um, that another thing about the courts that they were feminizing for men and masculine, masculizing, masculinizing for women and that this was very dangerous. So Louisa's um, association with, with the courts was seen, and, and with Europe in general, made her seem um, foreign and potentially dangerous. I mean, we have to remember that um, the United States had not just fought one war against Great Britain, it had fought two. Well, now we have our second. We do, foreign, although. Warren, first lady, different reception. Far different. Um, I mean, they do share, there is something very 19th century about Melania Trump and the reserve that she keeps um, from the public, which was true of Louisa, actually, um, not in the campaign. She was in very involved in the campaign, actually more involved than John Quincy in a lot of ways. But um, while he was president, she followed the precedent um, that Elizabeth Monroe had set of really staying at a public site. I don't think that Melania's, um, you know, foreign birth really was a issue at all in the campaign. And in fact, the only people who would point it out would be to hope, you know, in hopes that Donald Trump would kind of understand that she was an immigrant. But um, for Louisa, it really was a real issue, and that had a lot to do with where the country was coming from. It was not easy being an Adam. No, at it all. wasn't. And you go into this, I think, quite well in your in your book. Um, he it, he was country first. Yes. Family second. Yes. And then you know maybe books third. Yeah, books third. <laughs> Louisa fourth. <laughs> but also his personality, just his the way he was. I almost envisaged him, I mean, just, he was cold. He was a Puritan. Um, and when I say that he was cold, or when you say he's cold, you're using the adjective he used to describe himself and that everybody used to describe him. Um, that is the word. And the letters, they argued with each other yeah. a lot. At the same time, there was clearly a lot of um, physical passion between them. Um, not just, that's not just shown in how many times she was pregnant, but um, in some of their letters, there's, a, there's some pretty sexy language. Um, and so it's clear that there were, the physical attraction was real. And so was the emotional attachment. You know, people ask me, well, did they love each other? And I can say that it was a dynamic marriage, as marriages can be, with periods of real estrangement. But at the same time, you know, when he died, she was bereft. I mean, she was broken with grief. And even before he died, she wrote this letter to her niece, which just, it always breaks my heart. She said, you know, that she recognized that the end might be close. And the thought that he could leave her a widow paralyzed her soul. I mean, it was just, it was that moving. And after, after he did die, she was kept away from his body as he was dying. He was sort of died a public death among men, and she was furious about that because she loved him and she wanted to be with him in that moment. Let's talk about her and her very real accomplishments as, as a, a, a woman and, and why you were attracted to writing this book about her. As you mentioned, she wasn't some sort of secret power behind right. John Quincy Adams. But we could see so much, and I learned so much reading the book about um, Amer not only American history, but world history, through her life, the trajectory of her life, and through the writings that she left behind. She's a window for us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she, is, she had this highly unusual vantage point. 
Um, she had a perspective that no one else had. She traveled more than almost any other woman. Because not, also John Quincy Adams was moving about exactly. Secretary of State. and So she and, lived in Russia and Prussia and Germany and or not Germany, I'm sorry, but she traveled in Germany, um, traveled in France, lived in France, traveled all over the United States. Um, she had a, a ranging life and she met so many people. And, and that kind of was an exciting part um, of writing about her. But what was especially exciting is that she didn't regard them as oil portraits or people who would one day be famous or people who needed to be treated with some special reverence. I mean, she saw them as fallible human beings and called them out when they, she thought they were wrong. Jefferson, and, Jackson. Exactly. Um, and, and so that was exciting to see these people who seem so familiar in some ways, but through her amazing fresh eyes. So that was part of the appeal. But I was also drawn to this idea that maybe we have missed out on a lot of the most extraordinary people, especially I think women, when we put too much weight on a accomplishment. So I wanted to kind of write against that idea. Didn't you say in your introduction that you're, or someplace I heard you say that you're always drawn to the person standing next, next to, the to the person, person in power. In yeah. power. It's right. funny, I, I also write about sports and I'm always, I, I always want to write about the person who finished second. <laughs> I mean, there's something interesting to me about how do you deal with being so close and yet so far. One thing that was really interesting to me was that she had this healthy skepticism of democracy, mm -hmm. you know, and just kind of said, maybe over a skepticism. Yeah, well, she was, you know, she she looked at the situation and she said, you know, you guys aren't so. Classless. Classless, and, yeah. exactly. You know, you're, there's favors everywhere being given. There's a little bit of an, all, you know, a, there's an aristocracy here, For obviously. sure. And so a, she would call it out. Yeah, absolutely. And, and she also was very open about the fact that it would seem very unfair to her because in Europe, everybody could know the protocol. But in the United States, people were taking offense because it wasn't clear what the rules were. You know, so people were constantly gaming for some sort of, um, advantage and, and position, but it was always unclear whether or not someone was insulting someone or whether or not it was, you know, who was on top. And, and it created a lot more problems, I think, than she thought than, than it solved. Um, and it was, there's something false about it. Um, what would she say today, I wonder? Yeah, I know, right. Well, she would have had a field day with um, our current situation. You think? Absolutely. Um, she would have called a spade a spade. <laughs> she always did. She also was, or at least I came to understand through your book, she was in an interesting position as a woman in American history, kind of on the cusp of things, right? So she was reading about early proto-feminism. Proto um, I don't think she would have described herself as Certainly a not, feminist, yeah. but she was, and again, through her, the lens of her writing, she was bringing up some of these she very was, real issues and, and um, Kind of thinking or musing to herself about her role as a woman and, and feeling sometimes kind of um, hurt. Absolutely. I mean, she was, she definitely would not have called herself a feminist. At the same time, she was very interested in women's rights and what were women's rights. And one thing that she cared a lot about and thought a lot about was how she had not gotten the kind of education that she wished she had and that she thought women should have, and she was almost totally an autodidact um, and an amazing reader, just a wonderful reader and very smart. She wrote a lot about the things she read, but she was very, very, very self-conscious about the distance between her husband's Harvard education and the education that she had given herself basically in a dressing room with some books. I think that she could have been useful, and I think she thinks maybe she could have been useful, but she wasn't really allowed to be. That was never kind of an option or it was never even a, something brought up. So um, that's a kind of one of those the missed opportunities. In fact, all of her experience abroad that the founding fathers might have looked down upon, you know, being involved in balls and with monarchs. And when John Quincy Adams was campaigning and it was kind of 
considered distasteful to to do a right. true campaign. Um, there wasn't a popular vote in right. those days. You had to get other politicians to want to elect you. Um, her prowess came into play because oh, she absolutely. had given all these balls and parties, and she knew how to schmooze. She called it my campaign, um, and it was, I think, in some ways, really her campaign. She had a series of weekly parties. There were subscription parties. You had to sort of get Tuesdays with Mrs. Tuesdays Adams. Tuesdays with Mrs. Adams, they were called. And, you know, in 1824, Congress picked the president, and Congress was sort of at her feet. <laughs> I mean, they were um, really wanted, wanted that invitation, and she was a, a wonderful hostess. She was seen as this kind of star. She had an incredibly hard life. I lost count of how many miscarriages she had, how many times she was ill, she was bled by doctors, yeah. they did all manner of horrific things to her. It can be hard um, to separate she, the illness she, from the cur cure. She had to get on ships when she was sick or you pregnant. Know, pregnant, had morning sickness, um, miscarried on a ship. I mean, I just, my heart went out to her reading. Yeah. She had obviously what we would consider to be migraines. Um, she was incapacitated yeah. by illness so much of her life, and yet she kept plowing along and in fact outlived all but one of her children. Yeah. Tragedy struck her children. Her daughter died and, you know, as a young baby. Um, her son may have committed suicide, went over, overboard on a ship. Another son and his wife died of illness, and she, yet she kept persevering. Yeah, I mean, to me, that's a big part of the story, too. Resilience is a huge, huge, huge part of her story. Um, and how she dealt with all of these things. And one of the ways she dealt with them was by being open about her sadness, um, I think. And writing. And writing. Writing was a huge form of therapy for her. I, I, I have a lot more um, compassion for her than you might if you just came across some of her letters which seem kind of self-deprecating and just kind of miserable. But she had every right to be miserable sometimes. I mean, the things she dealt with were so sad. She left Russia on her own with a caravan, you know, and some people. Yeah. But it was a very dangerous time. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we don't have time to go completely into it. I recommend that you read this book <laughs> because she wrote this narrative of a journey, mm -hmm. which was is a blandest title for what she really went through. It was exciting reading your synthesis of this. I mean, she could have easily been killed on this she, adventure. She crossed Europe during the Napoleonic Wars and actually halfway through, I mean, these battlef battlefields, some of them were still, you know. She saw bodies laid yeah, out. Yeah, there was wreckage. I mean, the skeletons, um, carts, horses, skeletons. Um, I, but halfway through, she learned that Napoleon had escaped Elba and there was a real expectation that there might be another French Revolution, a civil war, and she was heading toward Paris, and everybody was telling her, don't do that. You know, Napoleon is also headed toward Paris, and she just kept going. Even when she was abandoned by several yeah, and of her, her male servants fled in fear. I mean, it was a crazy journey, and she just showed so much resourcefulness. She didn't just keep going. She just overcame obstacle after obstacle, and she used her kind of canniness and her real strength to do that and this is a theme in the book whenever she was called upon to rise to the occasion she did and, and i think she said it was poignant when i read it in your book um, when she wrote that book she said that she wanted women to know to yeah. never desert themselves yes i love oh. that line too never desert themselves so she was there was these embryonic feminist traits she wrote in her. that that um particular account i think is especially interesting and um Partly because, not just because it told a great story, but because of precisely of that. She wasn't, she was writing it for herself and her for her offspring, but she was writing it, I think she was writing it to be published. She wrote two drafts. She took years to write it. She researched it, actually. She was checking against her husband's diary. She had him reading it. Um, and she was writing it for other women. What was it like to spend this much time with 
Louisa Adams. Oh, it was totally immersive. Um, How? I miss it. it. She got into my, she was already in my head, but like I dreamed about her, I dreamed about her parents. I would have to sort of take time off and just disappear. I would go visit a friend in Texas or something and just w work, you know, and I'd just get into it because it wasn't the kind of thing where I could just d do it for an hour in the morning and then put it aside and forget about it. It was something that was like totalizing, um, but that's the only way I think I could have done it. Um, and emotional for you even to read oh, about absolutely. her dying. I mean, I cried every time she died. Every time I worked on the part where she died, I cried. When she died, wasn't it the first time that both the House and the Senate shut down for the funeral of a, of first, a woman, of yeah, a woman? to attend it? Yeah, no, yeah, she that's was pretty significant. She was, she was recognized. She was recognized, and um, and in fact, some of her pallbearers, actually, most of her pallbearers were public figures. Ultimately, Louisa, what do you think this book is about? That's a good question. The question I think about a lot. Um, I usually dodge it by saying it's about John, John Quincy Adams' wife, and then I'm silent. <laughs> um, I think it's about it's a, about this extraordinary inner journey. Actually, it's about this woman who wasn't always quite sure of whether or not she belonged, and who sort of made a life for herself and and made sort of meaning out of it. What's next for you? I know you want to kind of, you've said before, you want to kind of stay in this mess yeah. of this time period and, and you know, are you going to? Yeah, I have, I, um, I have a bunch of other projects that I'm working on, some journalism stuff um, and another book project that I'm working on. But um, I do have an idea for, it's another woman, another kind of woman behind someone more famous. Um, that I will talk about later, <laughs> but I am—I—I think I've found my next subject, and I'm excited about it. Or but, she has yeah. found you. <laughs> yeah, early days yet, so we'll see. Well, I know I will look forward to that. I learned you. so much from reading Thank your you. book about Louisa Adams, not only about her, but about uh, our country, our world. So thank you very much. Thank for you so much for having, having me. written it and talking with me. Appreciate it. You've been listening to Louisa Thomas, the author of Louisa, The Extraordinary Life of Mrs. Adams. Our conversation was taped at the 2017 Sun Valley Writers Conference. My thanks to the organizers of that conference for allowing us to interview some of their illuminating speakers. For more information, including how to watch this program again, check out the Dialogue website. Just go to idahoptv.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Check out our website, become a friend on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.